have uh, three other guests at uh, 5.30. But first, let me introduce uh, Mr. Louis Free. He is a former uh, special FBI agent. I think every agent's special, right? They all yes. get that title. So it's really not a special title. Well, so, it's a congressional title. It's a congressional title. But the, uh, the, someone, if, you know, if you're really special, I think they got to call you the very special agent or something like that. Uh, he became uh, a judge and then became director uh, of the FBI, and he was there during some exciting times, some very interesting things that happened, and we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, I've asked him to, in a sense, talk a little bit more about his career, talk a little bit more about being FBI director and a, very, a variety of diff different other things, and then kind of end in terms of talking about homeland security and urban areas and cities. Um, it just seems to me, almost as a throwing you a question, it seems to me that most uh, terrorist activity is going to happen in major cities. Uh, I would assume that most terrorists want to uh, inflict the greatest damage, and you do that in concentrated areas. Uh, yet, there's been a lot of criticism, including last week we had Councilwoman um, Janice Hahn uh, talking about uh, the lack of funds to urban areas, and specifically in her district, she represents the harbor. And I forgot what uh, puny harbor she was talking about that got more money than the LA harbor. Does anybody, it was like Martha's, Martha's Vineyard. She made the point that last year, there was more money allocated to for Homeland Security for Martha's Vineyard than for the LA Harbor, which is uh, LA San Pedro Harbors, which are combined the largest harbors in, in, the, in the United States. Um, so uh, we, he'll, he'll talk about those things. I'll ask him a couple of questions, and then you guys uh, get to ask uh, the um, FBI director some questions. So uh, Mr. Louis Free. And by the way, he's had a very long day today. I think this is your fourth talk fifth talk, and then after that we have another talk all here at LMU. Some of you might have been in the other classes. I, does, was anyone already there that's heard him talk? Okay, so we're going to ask you guys uh, if, he, if there was anything that he, he, con if he contradicted himself, so pay close attention. Yeah, you, um, yes, hey, no, right? Sam, no. yes. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> okay. If he wants to stand, you could, I'll just we can use this microphone. There we go, yeah. we can do that. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. It's my training as a lawyer. You know, we always stand up and we talk. First of all, we charge more and uh, you know, we can talk a lot longer than we can sitting down. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I wanted to just really talk for a few minutes and then hopefully uh, you can't hear me. You know, we got different kinds of mics. We got mics for the TV. Test, mics test, for, test. Yeah. Mike's for the room. Mike's for the recording. So they talk about government surveillance. <laughs> How about that? Can you hear me? OK, great. Well, again, thank you very much. And uh, I understand this is a long class, so I take my hat off to you. Anybody that can go to a class that long on a day like this uh, deserves some extra kind of credit. Um, <laughs> He's only here for one day and he's not grading, so. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, my background, uh, I mean, as you heard, I, was, I worked with the government for 28 years. I was very fortunate to have some wonderful jobs. I worked with some extraordinary people. The, uh, the best job I had was a 25-year-old uh, FBI agent in New York City working organized crime cases. I couldn't believe people would pay me to go to work every day. One of my first assignments, uh, I was in the office for a very short period of time, my supervisor said, would you like to work undercover? I said to myself, this is great. I've only been here a couple of weeks. I'm going to be an undercover agent. I said, sure, what do I have to do? He said, well, you need to join the Shelton Health Club down on Skemahorn Street in Brooklyn Heights, right across the river from Manhattan, and work out every day. I said to myself, this is wonderful. I said, I'm going to join a health club and work out every day. I said, well, what do I have to do there? And he said, well, there's a guy there named the Big Mike Clementi. And Big Mike was... Uh, at the time about 75 years old, senior member of the Genovese organized crime family. New York has five organized crime families. They don't count the Sopranos. They didn't count them then, they don't count them now. Um, and Big Mike had made uh, his bones, which is the term in the uh, mafia, which by the way is a politically correct uh, name. There are some people who said, well, you know, you can't say mafia, it's, uh, it's not correct, it's not uh, appropriate. The, uh, I was interviewing uh, 
a very senior ranking member of organized crime one day, one of the most powerful uh, members uh, in its history, Tommaso Buscetta. This was years ago, and I said, well, what do you guys call yourselves? And he said, the mafia. So uh, it is an appropriate uh, term. My job was to um, surveil one big Mike Clemente, and Mike had uh, taken control of some of the labor organizations in New York City, the Longshoremen's Union that controlled the docks, and that was a very powerful leverage for him because by controlling the unions, he could extract uh, money out of the shipping companies because when a ship stays in port, it's very expensive, and if labor slows down, uh, it costs them more money. So people would come in to the locker room uh, and give Mike money. That's where he collected his money. But he did it in a fairly unusual fashion. Uh, many, many years uh, past, uh, Michael had been uh, arrested, convicted on FBI cases because people wore secreted recording devices, thereby getting evidence which led to his convictions. So at 74, to avoid this, uh, he decided to take some countermeasures. And the countermeasure was uh, he would only take money from people in the sauna if they had no clothes on. And he had no clothes on. So my job, which turned out to be a harder job than I thought, was to hang around the locker room and stare at him all day. <laughs> and you know, people would come in while, while you were naked. While I was naked. Uh, people would come in with uh, suits. They'd take off their suits. They'd take a big white envelope out of there, and they would pay him. And this went on for a long period of time. And then Michael came up to me at one point, Mr. Clemente, and he said, uh, what do you do? He says, what are you doing here, kid? And uh, believe it or not, although I was undercover, no one had prepared me for a speaking role. So I didn't really know what to say. And having been uh, educated by the Franciscans and the Christian brothers, I didn't realize you could lie when you're undercover. That's so not I a said, problem for uh, Jesuits. I said, yeah, forget about the Jesuits. I said, I'm a lawyer at which point he offered to uh, have one of the judges in Brooklyn hire me because he said they were friends of his, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, what happened is, uh, fast forward, Mike is arrested. And my job, by the way, was to alert my squad members uh, outside when somebody had just made a payment. So then they would try to put them in a car, identify them, and then we'd develop them as a witness later on. So. Weeks later, Michael's arrested, and uh, we're arraigning him. We're bringing him into court. Uh, the people on my squad are, and I'm sitting in the front of the courtroom. They call it the well of the courtroom. You see on TV where the lawyers sit. Uh, and I'm sitting there with the prosecutor, and uh, Big Mike is trying to get my attention. You know, he's yelling across the courtroom, hey, kid. And I'm ignoring him. You know, when you don't want to speak to someone, you completely ignore them. And he's waving his hands at me, which is making a lot of noise because he's handcuffed. Um, <laughs> finally, uh, his lawyer comes up to me and says, uh, he says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, are you an FBI agent? Now I knew I didn't have to lie anymore. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm an FBI agent. And he shook his head, you know, and he said, I've been telling Mike all morning that you're the FBI agent. And he insisted that I come up and tell a judge to let the kid go because he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so that was my start. Uh, so, you, a, so you bonded with him? We did. We, we actually became good friends. In fact, during the trial, uh, whenever things were getting difficult to him, he'd say, hey, free, let's just get me out of here. We'll go get a steam together. So, you know, we did become good friends. Anyway, that's a very long and hopefully interesting introduction to uh, some of the work that we've done. I could speak for a long time about different issues. Let's talk about a couple of, uh, you know, homeland security, uh, urban issues. Uh, just today, actually, uh, some reporters upstairs wanted to have me comment on President Bush's uh, statement. I still haven't read it. I just saw the wire story about the foil plot to attack a target uh, in Los Angeles in 2002. And the reporters asked me about that. And before we went on camera, I said, well, I don't know anything about that. Uh, in which, to which they said, well, that's OK, which gives you some insight into journalism today. Uh, they don't care if you know anything about it. They just want to fill time and get somebody on TV. But um, what I did answer, uh, because I knew something about it, was the uh, planned millennium attack uh, with uh, Rassam. If you remember the end of 1999, he came over the border from Canada, was arrested by a very alert uh, border patrol officer. And his plan, as we later found out, was to attack uh, a target uh, at Los Angeles Airport. And that was actually part of a uh, tripartite attack, 
planned by al-Qaeda, one of which was uh, to be in the Los Angeles area. Uh, the other two attacks uh, were in different places. There was a plan to blow up a ship, a U.S. Uh, Navy ship, which was uh, taking fuel in Yemen, uh, the USS Sullivan's, which is a Aegis-class uh, destroyer. Uh, and the plan was to launch a suicide boat into the side of that ship and sink it, blow it up. And the third part of the plan was to attack uh, some hotels in Jordan and uh, murder by shooting as many Americans and Jews as they could that at that time of year were particularly uh, congregating at that hotel. So uh, it's not just big cities that are targets. Uh, we have seen, obviously, targeting uh, September 11th and others. Uh, our embassies in Nairobi, U.S. embassies uh, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in Nairobi, Kenya, targets. Uh, but uh, as seen in that particular plan, uh, the number of targets, particularly soft targets, available to people who are willing to blow themselves up to accomplish their mission are, are very diverse and very soft and very numerous which means you can harden uh, all your embassies and transportation systems, but you have, uh, you have malls, you have movie theaters, you have soccer stadiums, you have uh, people on bus tours, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have an uh, enemy that's uh, willing to die by detonating a device, particularly a suicide type device, uh, cities are uh, certainly targeted, but many, many other venues uh, diverse uh, from cities uh, are also uh, on the menu, one of the uh, I mean one of the challenges after September 11th was really putting together a rational and efficient homeland security plan, and that's taken a number of different forms. Uh, the Northern Command was uh, commissioned by the Department of Defense, which is a military command with the authority to act in a uh, an emergency or in the wake of a terrorist attack, particularly a biological or chemical attack. And that's a, uh, uh, that's a new development for us in the sense that uh, since the Civil War, <clears throat> uh, by statute, a statute called the Posse Comitata Statute, the military has been uh, forbidden to get involved in local civilian law enforcement uh, issues around the United States. And that's still a fairly substantial prohibition. But the Northern Command was formed to give the military uh, some operational authority in an emergency when the president uh, and governors and other elected officials uh, declare it to be. But to give you a, uh, a sense of how complex this is, the Homeland Security Department, which uh, except for the Pentagon is the largest single uh, federal agency ever constituted, particularly one dedicated to a law enforcement mission. And there was a, a great deal of controversy and resistance <clears throat> to forming uh, Homeland Security. In fact, the current president and the White House was adamantly opposed to uh, empowering and organizing a Homeland Security Department. They ultimately did because there was a lot of political pressure coming from uh, the 9-11 uh, family survivors, from Congress, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and that was done. But Homeland Security Department is 22 separate agencies, including the uh, United States Coast Guard, the Secret Service, uh, and 20 other uh, federal agencies. And the integration of that um, uh, department uh, will take many, many years. The current uh, secretary, who was a prosecutor with me in New York, uh, Mike Chertoff, has said that the integration of that system will take many, many years. And one of the uh, important concepts and repetitive uh, events we see in our homeland security, but particularly in our history with respect to law enforcement uh, and urban uh, you know, venues are very, very important here, is we have, um, we have as a nation resisted uh, national police force. There is no national police force in the United States, which is an anomaly if you've traveled uh, any place, Mexico, Canada, uh, you could probably name the country, there is a national police force. And when I was in my other job and my counterparts would come here from other countries, they would sort of scratch their head and they said, well, you know, are you the national police? The FBI is not the national police. There uh, are less FBI agents than Chicago police officers. And that's not because 
uh, we don't think we need more agents, it's because going back to the 18th century framers, uh, there was a great resistance to a national police force for a lot of reasons. One, the uh, British soldiers who were here during colonial times were the police officers. And when the, uh, when the revolution uh, proceeded and succeeded, uh, they didn't want to have uh, police. And if you, you know, think of the, uh, the concepts and the ideas and the fears of the framers, uh, George Washington said that the greatest threat to the country was a standing army. This was a military officer by training who had commanded the Revolutionary Army and defeated the British Army, the most powerful army in the world. Thomas Jefferson disagreed with him. He said the greatest threat to the country was a central bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many people and many scholars have commented that uh, one of the reasons that Washington, D.C. was selected for the capital, it was a swamp when it was selected, was because they really didn't want a central government uh, in, uh, in Congress because they thought that's when the country was under the greatest threat with respect to people's liberties, when the central government was trying to manage their lives. Now, we've ceded to a national army. We certainly have ceded to a national bank. But our law enforcement structure, our homeland security uh, defense, which is very relevant to the topics you're studying, is still an 18th century concept uh, and an 18th century model that uh, is not uh, survives because we think it's efficient. If you brought in a, um, you know, a junior management consultant and you said, look at this plan, you know, we got 18,000 police departments in the United States, 800,000 uh, state, local, and federal police agencies. We got 38 federal agencies involved in law enforcement, most of which have overlapping jurisdiction. Uh, where I grew up in Jersey City, uh, there are new towns every five or six blocks. Uh, so there's new mayors, new police chiefs, different radio frequencies. So the police departments, even at this late date after September 11th, can't speak to each other in a 10 square mile radius. And again, the reason for that, and the consultant will say, this system is ridiculous. It's dysfunctional. Uh, if you centralize it, you could save billions of dollars, literally billions and billions of dollars, more efficiency, more synergy, uh, real-time analysis, response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, much like our educational system, which is why there's fierce resistance in some quarters to national standards of education, we like our school superintendents and our police chiefs to be local, uh, where they're accountable uh, because of the enormous impact they have on our children uh, in terms of educators and our liberties and our safety in terms of police. So the People in a town want to be able to have the mayor come into a town meeting like this, and, and, and why, are there two, why were there two accidents at that particular intersection? In other words, they don't want to deal with a huge, uh, faraway uh, bureaucracy. And that's part of the uh, obstruction, uh, both historically and ideologically, to a Homeland Security Department. Why do we want to put all this power in one place? where they're responsible both for hurricanes uh, and terrorist attacks. And combining them and integrating them is going to take uh, a long, long time. Uh, in this city particularly, I mean, the transportation infrastructure, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the diversity of this city, I mean, I think it's been called the most diverse city in the history of uh, civilization. Uh, you know, how do we make it more efficient? Well, I saw in the paper today to put an extension on one of the uh, light rail systems. It'll take $5 billion in 15 years. Uh, you'll all be retired by the time that uh, line is running. Um, managing threats, uh, all the different law enforcement agencies, federal, state, and local, uh, that have to be in sync, not only to correctly collect information, but to analyze it quickly to be able to take advantage of uh, archives and information, all the related privacy issues, all the sharing, information sharing issues. That was one of the questions the reporter asked me. Why uh, did the president announce today that uh, there was a 2002 plot against the city building? And I don't know what the history is. I don't know, uh, and I'm sure we'll find out in the day or two to follow uh, what the history is. But the, uh, and I'll end here, the Homeland Security matrix, you know, is not uh, a simple or certainly inexpensive endeavor. 
Uh, we've spent billions and billions of dollars uh, since September 11th. And the question is, are we safer today than we were prior to September 11th? And I think the answer is not a simple soundbite, uh, yes or no. Uh, we're better prepared and better secured in some areas. We've hardened many of the targets, but there are, as I said, so many uh, options to harden targets uh, that if you have someone that's willing to die in an attack, uh, you can't possibly protect and harden all the possible targets. And the question then is to use available resources uh, smartly, efficiently, and in a manner that at the same time uh, that it provides security also protects our liberties. You know, in, uh, in many uh, cities in Europe, uh, particularly in Switzerland, uh, you know, you walk down the street and there are cameras everywhere. You won't see them, but everything is being recorded. Uh, and, you know, when you check into a hotel at night, uh, the police come by on a regular routine and take all the information with respect to the people who are checked in and put it into a central file. In probably every other democracy uh, in the world, uh, wiretapping, warrantless wiretapping uh, of citizens uh, is routinely done. Uh, and that information is never uh, disclosed uh, because in the UK, for instance, there's an official secrets act which would make even the reporting of that a crime, which is not the case here in the United States. Uh, we have had Conversely, you know, a very open and a very important discussion and debate and disagreement uh, about things like the NSA uh, wiretapping program. But that is, I would suggest to you, a very uniquely American debate. Uh, and the good news there is that we do debate it. It's important to us. Uh, people want to have a say. They want the information. They want the knowledge of those activities because they affect uh, directly uh, the exercise of your First Amendment, your other amendments, uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that that is a very uniquely American uh, factor. Every other country, by the way, uh, has uh, secret police. There's a secret police in uh, the UK. It's called MI5. James Bond was in MI6, but they have an MI5, which is a domestic security service, but it's really a secret police. There's one in Canada, there's one in Mexico, there's one in almost every country but here, uh, right after September 11th, you remember some of the proposals to create a uh, domestic intelligence agency, which is actually a nice acronym for a secret police. And that idea was literally run out of town because Americans have never been comfortable, probably never will be, with a secret police. Uh, officers who surveil, collect information, but never have to uh, be transparent in a courtroom never have to be examined and scrutinized and overseen uh, in the normal processes that we take for granted, including the media, which, by the way, can be a terrible nuisance when you're trying to run an operation in the government. But in a democracy, a very critical part of you know, our ability to understand, learn, and then have an input into how our lives are being controlled or not controlled or our safety protected or not protected. Hey, so we have some, anybody have some questions that we can ask the director? Uh, I, I got one quick one is, is there something unique about the FBI's work here in LA? Um, the type of cases, I oftentimes have heard that LA is the bank robbery capital of the United States. Uh, any, um, anything of that nature? You were, you were director of the FBI for eight years, right? Yes. Do you, do you remember when, think, when you thought about L.A. as, oh, that's a special problem or it's not unique or it's no different than the other cities? Well, there are many, many similarities in terms of the um, programs that are worked here by the FBI, the other federal agencies. Uh, Chicago and uh, Los Angeles are a little bit unique in terms of the number of gangs and the infrastructure that some of these organizations have uh, put together. Um, they probably meet the you know, academic uh, definition of organized crime, not the classical, you know, La Cosa Nostra kind of organized crime, but organized crime in many cities that don't have those problems, New York, Miami, et cetera. I mean, they have them, but in a much smaller degree. The, uh, the diversity here also has, um, you know, fostered gangs of many different uh, ethnic uh, derivations, where in other parts of the country that would not be possible because of the, uh, the lack of diversity in the population. 
the, uh, but, but no, I would say generally whether it's public corruption, civil rights, uh, white collar crime, which is all the corporate uh, and sort of accounting type fraud crimes, um, I wouldn't uh, distinguish the programs here very much. But the gang problem is a, uh, uh, is a much more uh, difficult uh, problem here and challenge than it is in many other parts of the country. Yeah. Dr. Singleton. And many of the states in the South had secret police uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. What was the relationship between the FBI and those secret police of those states? So let me repeat the question so just so they could be. Um, well, were there secret police in many of the states, especially during the uh, Civil Rights uh, time? Also, you know, we've heard a lot about the FBI under Hoover. Some of it would, de some people would define that as they acted as a uh, secret police. And even here in L.A., there was during a, a, a couple of police chiefs where they had uh, operations where they were, quote, unquote, uh, spy on uh, elected officials, uh, celebrities, and, and others. And so while we may not have formally have had a secret police, there have been in many times in U.S. history and local history uh, um, uh, law enforcement that has acted as a secret police. Yeah, well, that's true, but I wouldn't, uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't relegate that to the South. I mean, the New York City uh, Intelligence Division, it was called for many years, the Chicago, uh, famous Chicago 7 uh, trial and the evidence there. I mean, police departments had intelligence units that operated without any guidelines, uh, which meant that, in effect, uh, they operated as secret police. Secret police are, you know, law enforcement uh, agents who don't uh, abide by the rule of the law, have no guidelines, oversight, restrictions, prohibitions, and yeah, we had that uh, also in the FBI for a period of time. Uh, the point is that I was trying to make, if I didn't make it uh, uh, correctly, was that, you know, in the current debate about terrorism, uh, most Americans polled, but also as reflected by the lack of any interest in this uh, by the Congress, the, you know, no one has said, I think the best reaction to terrorism and the preemption and preparation of it in the United States will be to organize the secret police. It's not an idea uh, that worked. Uh, historically, of course, you can find examples of that, but I think, uh, you know, much like the reaction, if you remember the Defense Department shortly after 9-11 proposed uh, what they call the Total Information Awareness Program. And uh, the plan was to use data mining, basically public sources, and put together profiles on many, many Americans, uh, none of whom would be suspected of criminal or terrorist activity, but looking at uh, how you spend your, uh, your dollars, where you use your credit card, where you travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So profiles could be created, and then an analyst could come in and make a judgment as to whether there was a threat uh, related to this particular profile. But the important point was when the Department of Defense took that up to the Hill, uh, it was universally denounced and rejected. No hearings. Uh, liberals, conservatives said absolutely not. You know, we don't uh, want that. Uh, we don't think we need it, by the way. But the implications to privacy and liberty are very, very extreme. So that was thrown out uh, without a debate. And I think, uh, you know, when you go back to uh, the period of secret uh, intelligence units and COINTELPRO, which was the FBI program, uh, people were uh, convicted and went to jail because of that. Uh, I think that's not what people want uh, or certainly will tolerate in their, in their police uh, public safety departments, large or small, around the country. I think uh, Dr. Singleton asked that question because he's been arrested uh, for uh, uh, taking part in uh, um, the uh, civil rights, uh, and uh, he, he's got a, a history of uh, uh, interacting with secret police. So over here, I'm sorry, I can't see because of the light. I don't know. Go ahead and. and uh. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, this is kind of going on what you just uh, lightly touched on about uh, Edgar Hoover's um, COINTELPRO, uh, I guess, mission. What do you have to say about um, all, I don't even want to say rumors, because I feel like a lot of it has been legitimized about um, J. Edgar Hoover's uh, somewhat racist tactics of inciting violence, like within. Um, Oakland PD versus, I guess, the Black Panther Party, and then sending agents to infiltrate other civil rights organizations like that, and um, the wrongly convicted and the mass murders of different um, civil rights organizations. I mean, well, I'm so, go ahead. Yeah, 
Um, my question is just like if you guys what? are taking a stance of no, that's not true. All we were trying to do is because he Hoover said that the Black Panther Party was one of the biggest threats to homeland security. So I mean, now after all this has passed, time has passed, like thirty years have been by. Like, do you guys still take like do you still back that statement and all of his um? So do you find yourself missions? always having to explain for J. Edgar? No, I don't. I, first of all, I don't feel myself having to explain for that. I don't agree with any of that, I mean, that activity. Um, I certainly don't deny some of it. I mean, when you're talking about mass murderers, I'd like to know what that means because that doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, you know, ring any factual bells for me. But with respect to, uh, you know, covert programs which were directed against uh, peaceful organizations uh, and the subversion of those organizations and the harassment and prosecution of people belonging there too, yes. Uh, and I think uh, you won't find an FBI agent, probably many who served at that time, who would approve that or defend it. Um, so, uh, no, I don't defend it, uh, nor do I feel a need to defend it. Yeah. Um. And we're using the mic mostly, mostly yes, to record me. it than anything else. Cause um, all right, thank you ahead. for coming, sir. Uh, my question is uh, to kind of get your opinion on the situation going on right now at the administration with the idea of, uh, I guess, the illegal wiretapping, that kind of thing, in regard to Homeland Security and maybe how you feel about uh, what they supposedly did or did not do. Yeah, well, I mean, the, uh, I was asked that a couple of times today. I don't know what the facts are. And, I mean, one of the habits I have is uh, really to get facts before I, you know, offer opinions or conclusions. Your question characterizes it as illegal, which is what we would call a rhetorical or leading question in terms of the rules of evidence. Uh, it may be illegal. I don't know. Um, there's a substantial uh, constitutional question uh, with respect to what the president's war-making powers are. And that uh, question cannot be answered in the context of the Pfizer Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which requires warrants for domestic surveillance uh, with uh, one exception or a class of exceptions. Um, I don't know what the answer is because we don't know what the facts are. Unfortunately, you know, we can't uh, learn the facts. I don't know how that program was conducted, whether it was narrowly defined, uh, whether it was uh, broadly or uh, over uh, extended. Uh, and I think ultimately, you know, those facts will determine, you know, whether or not there was a uh, illegal uh, process or a uh, illegality committed. I think if, I mean, my own opinion, which again is a hypothetical opinion because I don't know the facts. You know, it's interesting when the reporters ask you, I mean, there was one upstairs before, but, um, you know, when things happen, uh, reporters need to find people to talk on television, not because they want to be informed, they need to fill up airspace. So, uh, you know, reporters routinely call me about things I have no understanding or basis of. And I remember one reporter called me, a very renowned uh, network reporter, he said, I'd like you to, I had left the FBI, I said, I'd like you to come on TV and talk about this. And I said, I don't know anything about it. He goes, that's okay. And I said, well, that's one of the problems with, uh, you know, your journalism. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what the, I don't know that the Supreme Court, this is my opinion, I don't think the Supreme Court will ever narrowly define the war-making war powers of the Commander-in-Chief. And I think uh, as a political question, uh, which is the kind of decision that a court does not decide historically over 200 years, uh, I could not imagine a court, actually any court, Supreme Court, narrowly defining the war-making powers of a president. And the constitutional question, I think, will rise and fall on the scope of that program. You know, does the Commander-in-Chief during wartime have the need and the constitutional right to intercept the communications of the enemy that is planning to attack you? If you phrase the question that way, most people would say, of course. Uh, if in an attempt to record the conversations of our enemy planning to attack us, we decide to wiretap everyone else in the country, that's a whole different issue. So uh, I, I think you need to get the facts, and I think uh, it's important for the government to produce those facts. And, you know, the reluctance is, well, we can't disclose, you know, the uh, program. Well, you know, every punitive terrorist in the world now is on notice that uh, conversations were being recorded. So 
I think it's important that uh, at some early stage for the government to explain that. And uh, I think not explaining it uh, engenders a lot of concern and mistrust. And uh, the facts here, uh, first of all, will, will, will not be avoided. So we ought to try to deal with them more rationally and more, more timely. Anybody else? Right, right here. Cornelius, speak nice and loud. Well, you know what? Wait, wait for the uh, pass. Yeah, pass that. No talking into it as you're passing it. Just um, outside of driving a black sedan and wearing a windbreaker jacket, most Americans don't know what the FBI do every day. What does the FBI do? What cases do you guys handle? And what operations do you guys, are unique to Los Angeles that the FBI handles? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, we have about uh, 220 different jurisdictions. These are jurisdictions that the Congress has uh, enacted for the FBI to be responsible for. Uh, some of them you probably have not heard of. Uh, for instance, the uh, Congress uh, several years ago, over my objection, passed a statute called the Deadbeat Dad Statute, which gave the FBI jurisdiction to uh, criminally investigate uh, people who weren't making their support payments, which, by the way, I think is, is a very bad thing and a very wrong thing to, you know, tell the FBI to investigate that jurisdiction with, uh, you know, less agents than Chicago police officers, I don't think is the best use of our resources. But politically, many times, Congress will enact a statute, uh, direct an agency, including the FBI, to investigate it, and of course, never provide any resources, which is a very important uh, process. But uh, our main programs, uh, uh, even after September 11th, is the, what they call the White Collar Crime Program, which is a very broad-based uh, program addressing economic crimes, uh, insider trading, uh, wire and mail fraud, uh, corporate malfeasance, uh, theft, embezzlement fraud, a huge variety of cases. And we are the primary agency that investigates that. Public corruption. Uh, the FBI is the primary uh, law enforcement agency for public corruption. I just left San Diego where they've been hauling people out of City Hall for the last couple of years. Uh, civil rights. The FBI is the agency that enforces the civil rights laws of the United States. Uh, copyright laws, trademark laws, major drug cases, organized crime, uh, child pornography, et cetera, et cetera. I could spend, uh, you know, 10 minutes giving you the recital of our jurisdiction, but what's um, uh, you know, gang cases, uh, kidnapping cases, bank robbery cases, extortion cases. But all uh, these seem to be specialties, so no, no one agent knows all of this kind of stuff. Don't you specialize when you want to? Yeah, we, we divide ourselves into programs, into squads, and uh, develop expertise. We have two agents in New York who are probably world experts uh, in art, in fine art, and they work on art theft cases, counterfeit cases. And Sotheby's calls them to come in and look at a piece if there's a question about its authenticity. So, you know, we have other uh, agents who, uh, you know, when the when TWA 800 uh, blew up uh, flying out of Kennedy Airport, we all thought that was a explosive device on board. Turned out not to be. It was a shorted wire in the fuel tank, uh, and you know, we immediately assigned people to that who had knowledge about that subject matter. I remember I went in to get the briefing and um, you know the agent, the case agent, he looked like he was about 12 years old and I said, you know, what's your background? He said, well, he said, the director, he says, I have a PhD in uh, aeronautical engineering from MIT. I said, okay, I'll shut up now. Uh, <laughs> and he had a blueprint, you know, of a 747 and was explaining to me the intricacies, you know, of the aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, we have Farsi speakers, we have uh, uh, people who can really do undercover work as opposed to what I did in 1975. So they're very, very uh, diverse programs. And one of the criticisms uh, that I have had about the, uh, you know, the movement of large numbers of FBI resources to counterterrorism programs after 9-11 is not that we didn't need those resources. But we've taken those agents from public corruption, from white collar crime, from civil rights, from gang cases, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't backfill. You know, one of the inanities of uh, budgeting, uh, as I alluded to before, is they constantly, you know, increase your jurisdiction. And, you know, 
this month, this is the most important violation going on, so we'll pass a law and we'll give it to the FBI. But they never give you any resources. And uh, the counterterrorism, uh, you know, prelude to September 11th was a good example of that. You know, we didn't, um, uh, it's not that we didn't know that bin Laden was uh, planning uh, to attack the United States. Now, they didn't figure out, unfortunately and tragically, that they were going to use uh, planes as bombs, but this was an organization that blew up embassies. They almost sank an Aegis class warship, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the run up to September 11th, and when I testified about this after 9 11, it was interesting uh, because none of the members on the Joint Intelligence Committee asked me one question about it. But I said, let me tell you about, uh, let me remind you about our budgeting uh, hearings and requests prior to September 11th. And what I reminded them is that in 2000, for instance, which was the last budget year before September 11th, uh, I asked for $342 million in new counterterrorism money. I got $5 million. Uh, I asked for 894 positions. I got three, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was amazing how no one asked me any questions about that. Um, but we do many, many different things with uh, very few resources um, and less resources than you would imagine. Okay, anybody else? Questions? Yeah. Yeah, we did, we did talk. I mean, what, what about that? When the allocation of, of Homeland Security dollars, and I mean, I haven't verified this, but doesn't the idea strike you kind of strange that Martha's Vineyard got more, you know, anti-terrorism money than uh, L.A. and Long Beach forts put together? Well, you know, I... I it, the face it, of it, it does, I mean. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, the old, uh, it's the old analogy about, you know, lies and statistics, you know, um, the that's story the, in the New York. That's how uh, Dr. Blakely teaches statistics, so he knows about that. New York that. Post story was, you know, railing against the fact that uh, there were more dollars given to the Virgin Islands than New York City. Well, if you do it on a per capita basis, yeah, but is that a realistic uh, measurement? Uh, no. So, you know, are we are we are we the best in class of budgeting money? No, but uh, it's probably not uh, not as irrational as that story would appear. What was your most difficult time as director, your darkest hour? Well, I mean, the darkest hour clearly were uh, several occasions when agents were killed in the line of duty. And, uh, you know, in a law enforcement organization like a military organization, those are very traumatic, very emotional, very devastating experiences. And, you know, I unfortunately had to preside over a number of those. Clearly, uh, uh, you know, the worst part of that, uh, of that job, any job in that regard. What was your most politically difficult situation? Uh, investigating my boss for seven years. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had not previously had a situation where the director uh, the and the attorney general uh, had to conduct criminal investigations of the president of the United States. So politically, uh, but more practically, it was a very conflicted situation. So how did, for instance, how did that play out in terms of how, how you ended up doing certain things? Generically, I'm talking about in, in approaching that. If there was no roadmap to doing that because it hadn't been done before. Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, actually, the, uh, the roadmap was clear in the sense that we tried to conduct that criminal investigation as we conducted every other criminal investigation fairly, thoroughly, uh, and avoiding any conflicts. The difficulty came uh, on a couple of occasions where... Uh, we were investigating a matter that, uh, from a national security point of view, for instance, the Chinese uh, intelligence service inaugurated a plan back in the early 1990s to funnel money, dollars, into the United States to uh, put into the campaigns of people running for office, which is a crime. Federal law, federal law prohibits, uh, on a criminal basis, the contributions of foreigners to political elections. And as we investigated that, uh, again, a program which was being conducted by the Chinese Security Service, the MSS, uh, we also discovered in the context of that investigation that people uh, in the executive, in the White House in particular, were complicit to that. So the difficulty, which uh, is important in your question, is on the one hand, we needed to brief uh, the White House on this campaign, a foreign government trying to influence an election, but 
the normal dictates of criminal investigation is you don't give information to possibly the subjects or targets of the investigation. So the Attorney General and I, Janet Reno at the time, had to tailor and redact the kind of briefing that we would not normally need to do in a non-conflicted situation. So those were difficult and complex things to... Yeah. There was a question fix. right here. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, first of all, I want to thank you also for coming. But second of all, I want to say it seems like there's a lot of policies or laws that maybe are more political than practical sometimes. And I want to say that which one law would you change if you could personally change one law that the FBI you think would be able to function more efficiently if you had your choice of one? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples um, where we did change the law because we, um, we thought it was important and... Um, the situation without that amendment was very difficult. Um, I'll give you two examples. One, uh, when I was newly arrived at the FBI, one of our biggest uh, white collar crime programs was health care fraud, uh, not just on an individual basis, but uh, companies, uh, groups of doctors, groups of lawyers, uh, just um, defrauding uh, Medicaid and the federal government out of billions of dollars because of fraud and double billing and all that. And interestingly, there was no statute that was specifically uh, addressing uh, health care fraud. We were investigating and charging people under mail fraud and wire fraud statutes, which means if you send a document through the mail that has fraudulent materials, it can become a federal violation. Or if you use a uh, wire communication to commit a fraud, that becomes uh, jurisdictional. But there was nothing that was really designed to deal with what was now a multi-billion dollar uh, crime uh, with respect to the United States. So we sat down and we, uh, we wrote basically a health fraud statute and it passed and now there's a health fraud statute specifically relevant to that. Another one was um, the uh, patent and trademark intellectual property uh, statutes that uh, existed on the state level but if you were stealing trade secrets uh, there was no federal crime. Again, you'd have to use wire and mail fraud conspiracy cases to make those, uh, 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 bring those cases in court. And we found out that, uh, for instance, many foreign governments uh, were using their security services in the United States to steal uh, pharmaceutical information and uh, uh, chip information, and then they would use that information and produce the product uh, overseas eliminating the research and development, thereby uh, competing uh, fatally with uh, the American producers. So that statute we wrote and it was passed. Um, you know, there's a lot of statutes uh, on the books uh, that need amendment, that need uh, updating and changing. Uh, the wiretap statute is a perfect example. I mean, one of the issues about the NSA program and the failure to adhere to the FISA statute is a technical issue. You know, when that statute was passed, uh, we had an analog uh, communicative network, not a digital one. So the time requirements uh, and uh, complexity of applying for warrants in the digital environment are completely different than what they were when the statute was passed. So, you know, that, uh, that needs to be addressed and, and updated. And the chairman of the Judiciary Committee yesterday um, said he was proposing a bill that would, in part, uh, do that. Yeah, over here. Uh, my question is regarding what the FBI does uh, investigating domestic terrorism, and if also um, if there's the connection between people like Timothy McVeigh, I know he had a connection with like a white supremacist group, so I want to know if the FBI monitors groups like that, and even now the Minutemen and the American Border Patrol, because it could be argued that they have racist sentiments. So. Well, you know, the, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, uh, that was an investigation that, uh, you know, determined, obviously, that um, one of his uh, motives uh, beyond the anti-government motive, which I think was the primary motive, uh, you know, he also had associations and histories with some of the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, hate groups, uh, particularly the white uh, hate groups. 
uh, Moody, uh, Walter Leroy Moody, who I prosecuted, uh, blew up a federal judge in Alabama and a uh, NAACP leader in Savannah, mail bombs, uh, you know, had a racial animus. He was a terrorist by everybody's definition. Uh, the Unabomber uh, decided he was going to blow up anybody who was uh, remotely associated with computer science because he thought that was a bad thing. So for 16 years, he blew people up with mail bombs. Uh, you know, the uh, Rudolph, uh, whose animus was directed against the uh, abortion clinics, uh, you know, acted uh, not just in Atlanta, but in Birmingham, killing uh, several people in the process. Uh, some of the, um, you know, the militias, the, uh, the white hate groups, the Aryan nations were convicted. The FBI took all their property, uh, basically put them out of business by forfeiting all their assets. Uh, the militia groups, which right after Oklahoma, the bombing in Oklahoma, we were very concerned about, uh, but the investigations uh, pretty much disclosed that beyond their rhetoric, they weren't uh, a threat, they weren't going out uh, and violating anybody's rights or risking their safety, and we basically left them alone. And we said, if you want to be crazy and talk crazy by yourselves and run around the woods with uh, paintball guns, that's fine. Uh, this is what you can't do, and if you do this, you're going to get arrested. Uh, but the, you know, the other uh, groups that I mentioned, individuals more than groups, uh, you know, that continues to be a part of the domestic uh, security risk and, uh, and matrix. And are those people less dangerous than Al-Qaeda? Well, they probably are. But uh, those people, if they fabricated a, uh, uh, a ricine bomb or an anthrax bomb, uh, could be just as lethal as an organized group being directed out of Afghanistan. So I think, you know, you have to be in many different theaters at the same time uh, effectively if you're going to really ensure safety here. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Anybody? Way over there in the back. Hi. Um, I just had a question because on Monday, um, actually when we had the court hearings and, um, and Alberta Gonzalez said that Obviously, when we were talking about um, the wiretappings and how necessary it was and vital for the national defense. So I was just wondering if you um, could give us like a little, um, some more detail about like what other anti-terrorism like operations that the Bush administration was probably undertaking without court approval. Um, no, I can't. First of all, I wasn't part of the Bush administration, so I don't have any knowledge of that. Um, and again, um, and, and not that. Uh, your question is not important, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but um, I mean, I don't know, and again, you know, like one of your colleagues' questions, your question rhetorically assumes uh, the illegality of an operation uh, before a factual response uh, is obtained. You know, in, in my training, we do it the other way around, but um, uh, no, I don't have any knowledge of that, and um, there's no way that I would if, uh, in fact, there was an operation that's not been heretofore disclosed. Well, but there, there are legal issues, there are policy issues, there are operation issues. How effective is wiretapping when you don't really have a target, but you kind of do a broad scale uh, attempt? It, g generically, you having done that, it, it, when you had a, a particular issue and you thought, maybe these people are involved or not, let's, let's cast a white net and try to get something. Is, not, not legally questioned, yeah. not politi political, but is it it's effective? It's a waste of time. It's a, oh. Yeah, it's a waste of time. First of all, even in a digital world, you know, the government doesn't have the resources to do that. Um, when I left the FBI, which was many years ago now, uh, if you added up all the federal, state, and local wiretap orders in the United States in one year, does anybody have a guess as to how many that would be? Anybody? Just guess. Give me some numbers. Just yell them out. 10,000, anything else? 3,000? No, just three. Someone. Three, okay. 100,000? 100, okay. Less than 2,000. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. Uh, the resources don't exist, even in a digital world, to uh, conduct just the implementation of a program like that. The federal wiretapping statutes, uh, Title III of uh, uh, Section 18, you know, 
make the government uh, uh, jump over an enormous burden to get uh, a federal judge to sign a wiretap. I got them to sign them as agents. I got them to sign them as prosecutors. I signed them as a federal judge. The, uh, the requirements are enormous, and you can look at the statute online. You have to show that there is no other investigative means that will be successful. You have to show with probable cause that that specific modality, whether it's a phone or a PC or a, uh, a social club on Mulberry Street, is uh, a place where people are talking about crimes. You have to uh, put in minimization procedures, which means if you're recording our conversation, we usually talk about murder, but we're going to talk about the Super Bowl today. You have to turn that off. You can't record that. You have to report to a judge every seven days. You have to give the tapes into court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can only do it for 30 days, and then you have to justify an extension. The uh, uh, person power requirements are enormous for that, which is why there are less than 2,000 done. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, but to answer your question, no, it would, be, it would be foolish and a waste of time, in my experience, to just sort of throw a net out there and, and see who we can uh, talk about. But there are things that are very critical and very targeted. For instance, uh, bin Laden was using a global satellite phone in Afghanistan to communicate. This was before uh, September 11th. And he would talk to his lieutenants uh, on a phone line, uh, which the NSA was able to intercept. Uh, and then one morning, he read in Time magazine that he was using a global satellite phone. And he stopped using it. He threw away his phones, and they never used another telephone uh, after that. So that was a very uh, dangerous and counterproductive uh, piece of uh, the operation as it developed. But you have to target that stuff. It's, it's foolish, a waste of time, and illegal, by the way, uh, to do it on any other basis. Uh, of the 2,000 approximate uh, cases, what would be your estimate that uh, they were effective or led to prosecutions or helped with prosecutions? I don't know the state and local statistics. In the federal uh, wiretapping orders, about 90% of them resulted in evidence that was used at a trial. Okay. Well, we've run out of time. We want to thank Mr. Lewis Pree for uh, being here.